Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, this, good morning. Uh, so this is the I'll call to order the Concord Middle School Building Committee meeting. It is Thursday, March 4th, approximately 730 in the morning. And I will call roll. Uh, let's see, we've got Pat Nelson. I see you waving, Pat. Hello. Yes, here I am. <laughs> Great, thanks. Uh, Matt Johnson, not with us today. I actually don't see him. Okay, well, maybe, maybe he'll join in a few. Court Booth. Present. Thanks, Court. Uh, Heather Bout. Present. Hi, Heather. Uh, Justin Cameron. Present. Hi, Justin. Frank Cannon. Present. Frank, Stephen Crane. No Stephen with us yet. Uh, Kate Hanley. Here. Kate, John Harris. Present. Thanks, John. Russ Hughes. Here. Hi, Russ. Lori Hi. Hunter. I'm here, thank you. Hey, Lori. Charlie Parker. Here. Chris Popoff. Here. Hey, Chris. Matt Root. Present. Hey, Matt. And Jared Stanton. Present. Just phone in the building now. <laughs> okay, Jared. Well, we'll we'll see you in a few minutes right. then. <laughs> Great. And then I'm going to ask Peter Fischelis. Is that how you say it, Peter? Uh, I see you on here. I'm going to do a formal intro in a few minutes on the agenda, but I'm going to ask if you want to say that you're present with us today. I am present. And tell me how you say your last name. Fischelis. Fischelis, okay, great. Um, so we will, and I'm Don Guariello, and of course I'm here. So I will call the meeting to order. Let me switch over to the agenda. Sorry about my kids, they're looking, they're like playing hockey behind me, even though I asked them <laughs> to do it elsewhere. All right, um, approval of minutes. So looks like we have minutes that were circulated from February 11th. Uh, 2021. Has everyone had a chance to look at those and um, provide any edits as necessary? Would anyone like to make a motion to have those approved? If oh, you see uh, fit? Frank, yeah. Okay, thank you, yes. Frank. Was there a second? Did I miss it? Second. Thank you, Heather. Any discussion? Hearing none, I will uh, take a roll call vote. My computer's slow, I'm sorry. I'm just gonna move between things here. Pat Nelson. Here, uh, oh, of course, yes, I approve. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I still don't see Matt unless someone tells me otherwise. I'll assume he's not with us this morning. Court Booth. Yes. Heather Bout. Yes. Justin Cameron. Did we lose Justin? Maybe. No. Oh. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, Frank Cannon. Yes. Uh, Stephen Crane. Stephen, let me know. He'll be on in a minute. Okay. Great. He's having trouble. Yep. No problem. Kate Hanley. Yes. John Harris. Yes. Russ Hughes. Yes. Lori Hunter. Yes. Charlie Parker. Yes. Chris Popoff. Yes. Matt Root. Yes. And Jared, you still in the car? Or are you with I us am out of the car and walking in, so yes. <laughs> okay, okay, thanks. And then Peter, I'll ask for a vote from you. I assume you'll abstain, but I'll ask. I will abstain. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, great. So we're through the minutes, and uh, we now have, oh, um, Concord Middle School Subcommittee and Project Team Business. So here's where I'll introduce you. So as you may have noticed in the past couple of minutes, I'm asking for Peter to um, give his uh, attendance and, and vote on the minutes. Peter Vichelis, did I say it right? You got it. Um, is joining us as a new member via the select board. So thank you very much to our select board for um, having uh, Peter um, join us. Peter is a former 
FinCom member, and I think his resume is longer than that, so I'm going to ask him to speak to it because I don't want to get it wrong. <laughs> but many of you may know Peter. Um, I think, Peter, you sat in as the FinCom representative for a while as part of our meetings, which is how I recognized you when, um, yep. when your membership was introduced to me. So that's great to have you officially with us. If you want to say a few words, say uh, introduce yourself for those who don't know Peter, and we're going to welcome him with open arms. And um, just so everyone knows, I've, uh, a couple of us have touched base with Peter earlier this week, kind of brought him up to speed, shared some background information and some, um, you know, online meetings that he could watch to kind of, you know, do a little homework and, and get up to speed with where we are since we're at such an important crossroads. Um, so, Peter, if you want to say a few words, please. Thanks, Don. Yeah, good morning, everybody. Uh, looking forward to joining the crew here. Uh, I have been involved in a lot of projects in Concord. Uh, lived here all my life, pretty much. So I'm a townie. Uh, I did serve on the school board for two, uh, two sessions, um, worked on the Willard project, uh, the Alcott project and Thoreau and, and the high school, as well as the fields projects and, and some other ones. Uh, most recently I was on the um, finance committee. I, I recently resigned after uh, a term and, and a year and uh, Susan asked me to step up and help here. I was the observer, so I've watched your work and was impressed by the committee and all the work that was done. So when she asked me to join, I said, uh, I'd be happy to. So that's, that's it. Great, thank you. Your resume of school work is almost as long as mine, Peter. <laughs> you, <laughs> you've worked on every, every recent school project in town, which is awesome. So uh, we welcome Peter with open arms. Um, anyone wanna ask anything of Peter or say hi or uh, open it to anyone if you're Good interested? Morning, Peter. <laughs> I'll just I'm say gonna... I'm glad I am he's joining us because I know Peter has really deep experience and knowledge in all of this mm -hmm. and is a really good positive force for progress. So I'm really glad he's here. Thank you, Peter, for joining us. Ditto. <laughs> I was going to say I second that. Yep. <laughs> I know Pat worked with Peter on the Willard project, so uh, they know each other. And yeah, so we welcome you with open arms, Peter. We're going to assume that you can get brought up to speed fairly quickly. Again, if you need anything, reach out to any subcommittee chairs or Pat, myself, Lori, uh, Heather on the communication side. So we're all here for you if you need anything or need some background on anything. So great. Thank you. All right. Awesome. So welcome. And we're going to jump right in. Um, I would like to um, request everyone's approval to take agenda items out of order and um, to move the correspondence up because I feel it might be relevant to some of our discussion today. So rather than having it um, at the end as we typically might before public comment, I would ask that someone uh, make a motion to, to take the agenda out of order and move the correspondence um, to now, if that's okay, so that we can hear what folks have sent in related to uh, the building before we have discussion about recommendations. So moved. Okay. Thank you. Do I have a second? Second. Excellent, thanks Frank. Okay, so with that, I will turn it over to Heather to um, summarize some correspondence, if that's okay, Heather? Uh, yes, it is. I was. I'm, I Are you prepared? Huh? Well, I, I, I was planning on it at the end and was going to do a final count then in case any more came in. Oh, any more. Okay. Um, um, but that's okay. Well, that's okay. As of right, yeah, as of right now, if you wouldn't mind, and sorry yes. to put you on the spot, it just felt like related to some of the recommendations from the design subcommittee later on the agenda, it might be helpful to have some background on what we've heard from the community so that as the recommendations come through, we can digest that. Yep, of course, absolutely. Oh, sorry to do that to you. <laughs> no, 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 that's totally fine. Um, I'm just gonna do our final count now as I look, yes. Okay, so- It's been a lot. <laughs> sorry? It's been a lot, so yeah. Yes, exactly. So we have a total, since our last meeting, we've had 50 emails from the community. Um, of those, the majority of them are about the gym. Um, let me see, one, two, three, four. In fact, of those 50, 47 of them have been primarily, ab have been about the gym space. Um, as you've all seen, most of them have actually the same 
text. So it was it was handed out and people used it as a way to say, yes, I agree, I'm lending my support. Um, they did, I just wanna point out most of them did say they, they were focused on making sure that they know that, or that we know that they want two gyms. And so I think that's relevant to our conversation later as to put in terms of how we're able to use the 7,000 square feet that are proposed if we um, vote for that. So I wanna make sure that we point out that. Um, also, I wanna point out that Pat Nelson has responded to every single one and that is a big job. So huge thanks yes. to Pat for doing that. Um, in terms of the other ones that were not regarding the gym, uh, one was a dual purpose of both the same support for the gym as well as a note to consider hardwiring instead of just wireless. Um, there was another one that also uh, asked for uh, consideration of hardwiring. And then there were two that were focused on a larger auditorium and perf or performing space. Um, so that's the summary. Great, thank you, Heather. Can I jump in with one more, Don? Yeah. We got one letter from Mothers Out Front that was signed, I haven't counted, but it was signed by many, many, many folks. Um, so it was just one letter, but all calling for the same thing, um, supporting the sustainability goals um, that the sustainability subcommittees already discussed and is in our recommendation that is coming up later. Yeah. Thank you, Kate. I can't believe I forgot that one. It was a different pile to mention more specifically. <laughs> So let me understand, because I don't think I've seen that one. That one's uh, Mothers Out Front, a lot of signatures supporting the recommendation that's forthcoming. Is Do I understand that correctly? Not specifically the recommendation, because they sent this before. Oh, that it was, was before. Us. Yeah. Okay. I have it up if you want so me maybe to share that, or we can share it later. Is it the one that Linda read at the community meeting? If so, I have seen it. I just lost track of it in time as far as... Um, I was thinking it was that came between building committees and I'm mixing up meetings. So um, it's okay if you want to share it, feel free. She read it at the um, uh, verbally at the community meeting last Wednesday. Okay. I wasn't at the community meeting. I imagine not everyone was. So, yep. Thank you for bringing it up. And if you want to share, feel free. Or if you want to read the, the content, what's relevant, um, by all means, please. They're an important group that we want to hear from. I think you can see it. Uh, it says you're starting to share, so it's coming. <laughs> Here we go. Yeah, sluggish this morning. That's right, I have seen this, yep. Yeah, I think everyone's seen this too, but um, I think you can see there's many, 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 many signatures. Wow. Yes, I can give it a, can give it a number count, but yeah. Looks like over 50, easily, yeah, okay. Sorry for the dizzying scrolling. <laughs> so if anyone hasn't seen this and wants to read it, we can certainly send it along. So just reach out if you haven't seen it. So thank you for bringing that up. And that's that'll be important as we get to the sustainability subcommittee recommendations. And just, to clarify, well. just to clarify, it did go to the full committee. So I don't committee. want people out there to think that we, that it hasn't been circulated. Everybody Correct. should have received it. I just, I'm wondering, Peter maybe hasn't because his That's arrival good. was since that has come through as correspondence. So I'll forward it to you now, Peter. Perfect. Thank Thanks, Heather. Sure. Okay. Um, is that all we have on correspondence? Any other comments before we move on? Yeah, I, I would like to just speak to, uh, the letters that came in about the gym. Please. Um, I, I'll be happy to review my qualifications to say what I'm about to say, um, if you want. I'm, I'm very keen on uh, the community gym desires. My family is hugely keen on it. But I do think it's important that uh, we look at the, the notion that rental monies could be, be a factor. Um, because that's not been the experience of the school district. Um, you know, we, we, we struggle to break even on those, on those uses. So it's not a revenue generator. Um, and I think that would require a, a big rethink of our approach if it were to be a, a generator. That's all. 
Great. Thank you for that, Court. Anything else? Uh, Don, I don't know when uh, the, the right time to have the discussion uh, about the gym, but I'm, I'm curious and I've been trying to get up to speed and talk to people about it. Uh, I know the current recommendation is, is for the 7,000 uh, square feet. Uh, having, having lived through a number of the building projects and s kind of seen what I felt like we did well and what we didn't do well, uh, in my opinion, we should have made some of the gyms bigger. Uh, some of that was we were um, constrained by the state. Uh, I think that if I look at uses, uh, the gym is something a, a community gets a lot of use out. And while the focus needs to be on the educational programs for sure, uh, this is a community building. And I, I know that in talking with Lori, there was some accommodations to make a bigger gym. And I know there's some issues with impervious soil and so forth uh, that have to be dealt with. But I feel very strongly that we, we really should look at this very, very carefully and, and take the community's input and see if there's, there's options to make it a, a somewhat bigger space. Um, I think the cost benefit and, and is, is potentially there to do that. And so I, I hate to be the guy jumping in late when so much work has been done, but I, I just, having looked at the other projects and where we, we should have done better, that's, that's one area. Um, Don, this is the time when we want to let SMMA, it's, um, just to give a little context to this conversation, and a little history to what we've been considering. Mm -hmm. you have a couple yeah. of slides on that. Yeah, I think so. Are you prepared, Kristen, now to do that? Yeah, we've been. Okay, so uh, sorry, I was going to thank Peter for his comments, and it sounds like um, our designer has some slides or, or information and background of some of what's been looked at to date. So, Kristen, if you want to move forward mm -hmm. with that. So um, we have been hearing uh, about the gym concerns and, and um, it's been passed along to us from the building committee. And so we wanted to clarify because I think that sometimes um, when people say two gyms, it can be misunderstood because there's practice court use and there's full size court use and things like that. So, so we put together just a, some basic uh, background information to help um, with the further discussion. The Sanborn existing gym is about 6,800 net square feet. And we believe that, uh, the information we have is that it's striped at 74 by 42, which is uh, shy of MIAA regulation size um, by 10 feet uh, in the long direction and eight in the, in the short. Um, Peabody uh, is a 3,700 net square foot area and it's um, pretty square in shape. And we believe that the, the striping may be something like uh, a 50 by 39 or something like that when you take off the run out, uh, run out perimeter and everything from that area. So it's, it's a, more of a, a, an alternative or an accessory uh, gym space. Um, so what that works out to be for school use is the equivalent of three teaching stations because you would drop a curtain down the center of the Sanborn gym and that would be two stations and then the Peabody is the third station. Um, the planned gymnasium is uh, 7,000 net square feet in the, in the current recommendation. And it, that includes a MIAA size main court or when subdivided uh, to 55 by 39 foot cross courts. And then we also, as you've been hearing, have the alternate PE space. So depending on scheduling and use, um, you have a minimum of two teaching stations in the main gym and then the alternate PE can be used as a third if, if needed for scheduling but that may or may not be how the school intends to use the alternate PE. So we did an update to the sketch, thank you Phil, 
um, that shows the 7,000 uh, square uh, net square foot gym. Just because some people are more visual learners, here we see um, that it's approximately uh, 70, 70 by 100 in this sketch with eight and six foot runout on the edges. Here's your 39 by 55 foot cross court with the divider curtain, the bleachers for 150 that we've been discussing, and then over top um, the, the main court that is MIA regulation size. So early on, we, we knew uh, when we started in January that there was a strong desire for additional gym space and community use. So we had met actually with CCYB and, and another number of other the community athletic um, groups. And what we learned is that they use both the Peabody and Sanborn gyms and they use them for practice courts and that they do use the Sanborn gym main, uh, main court as a game court. So, um, so two practice courts and then one uh, sandboard main court. Now we're, if the site conditions were different maybe and, and the budget constraints were different, we could have continued to have the conversation more but we were really working to balance that three-legged uh, bench stool that we've been talking about and accommodate the educational plan requirements uh, within the budget. So, so what we did, feel like though is that we were still able to accommodate CCYB in the sense that they would still have two practice courts, albeit they would both be more of the Peabody type size, and then they would have the one MIAA size main court for games. Um, and then thinking, uh, Peter, you were noting that you've heard the, the considerations and, and that go into this is that we do have that 15% coverage limitation. And um, so if we were to add 6,000 net square feet to that ground floor to accommodate the extra gym space, we would be reducing flexibility for the adjacencies and the location of some of the other educational spaces on the ground floor. They might have to move up or down or over um, to accommodate that increased uh, ground floor footprint for, for a larger gym. We know a little bit about the funding, the construction costs. There's always, uh, there would have to be the, we understand maybe a public private partnership um, process. And we would actually need that commitment before schematic design starts, which right now we're targeting May. So that's a pretty quick turnaround. And, and I know that Lori has been um, thinking about what, uh, you know, and has iterated some thoughts about the timing of funding and that commitment to move forward. Um, and then some of the other ancillary con uh, considerations are, of course, you're adding additional volume for heating, cooling, lighting, uh, energy costs, and then also facilities maintenance. It's kind of a, uh, additional thoughts. But we just wanted to clarify the number of teaching stations are being maintained. Um, and that we believe that even though they're, that we're still providing two practice courts for CCYB, it's just, there's not one smaller and one larger, they're two equal. So I hope that helps. And, and to, to be clear, uh, it, if you were to try and get two uh, full-size cross courts in, the gym size would jump to 13,000 square feet. Right. Don, if I may. Um, Kristen, can you go yeah. back to the uh, considerations yes. slide, please? Um, so, uh, something we discussed at uh, the design subcommittee uh, was, I, I think I was notable in this, um, the, the, the question, uh, does this uh, 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 base itself on the treetop design, uh, which was the recommendation that we favored when we went on pause a year ago? Um, and, and the answer was yes. Um, and the other question was, are we wedded to that design? We, has it really influenced uh, what we did with the ed plan or what the ed plan did with treetops? And I think the answer was no. So uh, the, the result of those conversations, I think was a uh, treetop stays, but I'm not sure who makes that decision and, uh, and I'm not sure why, but I think treetops and 15% are inseparable. So I think this committee does uh, deserve an opportunity to dig into that. Yeah. Is that clear? 
Yeah, and, and just to elaborate, we are looking to move forward into those concept sketches um, through the, the vote today if, if we're accepting the space summary. Um, if, if there's an interest, um, and, and to your question about continuing with treetop teams or not, um, there were four or five uh, concepts, I think early on five, but whittled down wow. to four mm -hmm. um, concepts that were presented and, and there was an overwhelming support for treetop teams. So we didn't feel like throwing everything out and starting over revisiting what we already knew. Um, yeah, but, but, but remember that, that, that came from the design committee mm -hmm. and it was the design committee that sought a, a reconsideration. Yeah. Uh, and, and we have this problem. So if, if this problem might be addressed by not being stuck with that, uh, that one choice of five, if there are opportunities for designers to design uh, that would, would ameliorate this problem, um, wouldn't we want to do that? I mean, to Peter's point, you know, we, uh, we want to get a gym right this time if we can. Now, maybe we can't on this site. Maybe we can't. But we want to give the community the, the confidence that we tried. And if the um, if the building committee uh, would like to move forward with uh, the sixth with the larger gym, understanding the funding risk in this um, and the potential influence on just locating the ed educational spaces, we can absolutely do that in concept development. But um, we would just want that direction today. And again, it's not to say it's not possible and we couldn't study it, but we would need that direction today so that we could explore it in concepts. And we just want to be very transparent about. Um, the impact to the ground floor program. That's perfect. You mentioned the the budget word, and uh, that intersects uh, immediately with this too, because our projections have us at, at our stated town town meeting limit at the point at this point. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, just a couple quick comments, if I may, um, Dawn. And I like having this in mind. But I think it would be helpful for SMMA and our project manager to look at alternatives where we say, for example, if 6,000 net square feet in addition to get to 13,000 square feet for let's say two gyms is just not feasible because of site constraints, is there a significant amount of square footage that could be considered without butting up against the 15% lot coverage limit? So at some point, you'd say, for example, roughly adding 1,000 square feet to 7,000 may make a difference educationally and recreational use. 500, maybe that's too small. Or maybe the significant number is if you can't add at least 2,000, why bother? Something like that would be helpful. Uh, I also, I just want to verify the high school gym is 11,500 square feet, just to give people kind of a visual idea of what a larger gym looks like. Is that right, Kristen? I think you had 11,500 for the CCHS main gym. Um, I actually hadn't looked that up recently, so I'm not I, sure. I, I think you had one of, I could be wrong on that. So that's also something just to keep in mind. So people looking at what does running around space look like uh, relative to things. Um, but yeah, I think kind of fine tuning that and really knowing butting up against the limit. And the other point with respect to treetops and following up on quartz ideas, the treetops concept may be where we end up, but looking at how that can be fine-tuned and adjusted uh, square footage-wise without compromise in the educational spaces. You know, there may be uh, shorting, uh, for example, the wing between the educational spaces, we'll call it, and the, the front T space. There's, there may be some adjustments. And again, thinking of, is there significant amount of square footage to be found that's worthwhile? It may not be, but th those are the kinds of things I like to keep in mind as we fine-tune what, what kind of limits we're up against. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, the educational program, while adjusted, primarily the made most major footprint difference in the educational program is the uh, probably, probably the auditorium space. But all of the other um, balancing that was done, we don't believe that there's a reason to again that that the treetop teams wouldn't be a, the perfect starting point, since it was so well supported um, before. So. Um. My, my one comment on that, um, as that potentially moves forward as a consideration um, after we get through the space template, is to look for efficiencies and 
trying to tighten the the envelope and footprint of that. It was my recollection, and it's been a while since I looked at those plans, but um, it was fairly generous in um, sort of corridor space and how you maneuver around the building. So there may be some efficiencies in that that will help us with this to shrink the footprint um, and look for efficiencies, which also means less envelope, potentially, you know, um, less footprint, tighter envelope. And I, I think all of that will help us, must serve us well as we consider designs. Okay, anything else on this? Um, if not, I I'd add that um, sure. I echo Court's uh, desire to make sure that we really, really push on this. And that when we go to the community, we have explored every single option. Uh, I know it's a big desire out there. Uh, just in my recent discussions, I've talked to a lot of people. Uh, and, and to me, it's, it's, this is a big project. This is a lot of money. And if, if there are community interests that can be served by this building, in addition to focusing on the educational program, we ought to do everything we can to make sure we're at least considering that and, and exploring every possibility. So I, I would really encourage the, uh, the folks at SMMA to go back and, and really look at this uh, to see what we can do to get the gym bigger and, and put cost to it. Obviously that's, that's gonna be an important part to it. Can I ask a question? State the, um, state the obvious that that there's the 15% lock coverage and redesigning the building to shrink the building so that we have the space to do the gym is one is one question that I think this committee is going to have to consider. But the other question is, how do we fund it? Or we, we can know roughly what adding this gym is going to cost the project. How do we get commitments for funding it prior to going into schematic design? Um, and I, I just that these these they're so intertwined. And I would love to see a bigger gym. I would love to see another gym in town, but um, I just don't know if the middle school can can carry that. Uh, so, I have a clarifying question because I haven't had as many like you know face to face or or telephone conversations with uh, community members. Is the desire to have a separate space or a larger gym that is dividable into two larger? Does anyone have clarity on that? I, I, I think uh, the community is not telling us it has to be at this location. What the community is telling us uh, first and foremost is the current uh, status is, uh, is completely inadequate in the estimation of the people communicating with us. The solve is, is more up to us if it's possible. Uh, you know, there's, there's, uh, people talk about uh, uh, 1129 Main Street with a field house. Uh, people talk about holding on to the Peabody Gym. There's, uh, but that's a little bit out of our purview, of course, which, which to Pat's point makes it even more complex. But to, to your point, Lori, the lot of feedback I get is one solution could be the larger gym that's dividable to create larger spaces than we could under the 7,000 square foot thing. So I don't think anything's off the table, but to your point, yeah, I don't think anybody's wedded to say you must add a separate building as it were. I think, I think you, you start with combining it to your point, Don, as, as one building and, and how big can it be within the site constraints and, and within the rough budget we have. Um, mm -hmm. I think the numbers are still very challenging to know if you're still within comfortably 100 million or not with something larger. I, I, I don't know enough yet to say you could put a number on 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, or 6,000 square feet added to a, 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 you know, the base design of 7,000 square feet for a gym. I have a, I have a question. You know, when I read those letters, this is Charlie, I, when I read those letters, it seemed to me, and I may have misread them, but it seemed to me they were asking for a second full-size basketball court, not for bigger cross courts. It seemed to me that 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 the question was we need another full court for for uh, you know for tournaments and so forth. 
Um, so I, I don't know. I mean, I, you know, it would be helpful, I think, to clarify what people think, you know, is really being asked for and what people really think the requirement is for additional space. Is it for more cross court space or is it for a second full size, you know, uh, uh, regulation uh, playing, playing court, uh, playing space? Yeah, that was, thank you, Charlie. Um, that was pretty much what I was trying to wrap my head around because I have done cross courts that are like 74 and a half or something by 50, which are just under MIAA, 70, I, I'd have to go back and look, but two cross courts, basically full size with an electronic wall, basically that you flip the switch and it closes. It's like 18 feet tall or whatever and provides literally two separate spaces versus the vinyl, you know, curtain that drops that's like open air that you can hear in between. So there are different options. And I've done that in like 11,000 and change. It's tight, like the runoffs aren't great, but it at least provides that space. So that's why I was trying to wrap my head around what the actual desires are. Or is it a whole separate part of the similar to the high school where they have that separate training gym or the, the smaller gym versus the competition? John, I Don, I could read a little from the letter we got originally in February um, that I think ex answers the questions you're trying to. Yeah, if you have that queued up, great. About. Yep. Uh, so the ask originally, let me just find the right paragraph here. Uh, Facility would need to include bleacher seating, direct external access, independent HVAC for two high school regulation basketball courts with six hoops per court and line painting that satisfies the requirements of multiple sports. Uh, I think that's probably the basis of the information you need is that description. Uh, if I could jump in, Lori, I had a discussion uh, last night with uh, Mark Carusco, who runs the yeah. UCY uh, Youth Basketball, and he, his, uh, his ask is to have two full-size courts that could be run simultaneously with, uh, so that it could be accessed during the weekend, separate entrance, and other community members who run uh, the other youth sports organizations would love to have a large space uh, to conduct practices during the winter. But I think from a size standpoint, that having two full-size basketball courts that where you could have boys and girls running simultaneously, having games, and having some level of spectators is, is what the ask is. Right. And, and Mark's the author of that letter I just read. So um, just a couple of things. I'd been trying to you know, do a little behind the scenes to just understand what, what our options might be. And you know, the slide sort of reflects where we got to. Um, you know, impervious surface, we've got a long history of that at the high school with some big challenges. To even ask for a variance, you do need a design. So just so everybody knows that, I had some questions over the last few weeks of why can't we just ask and find out, well, you need a design to ask. And we've had several occasions where we've gotten to the point of that, you know, getting design done and then turned down. So just noting that. Um, and then in terms of private public, it's, you know, this would, we'd have to decide who even is the decision making group to consider that option. I'm not clear about that, whether it's select, my guess is it's select board. And just in history of you know, two very prominent public-private partnerships, very successful. Um, you know, CC at Play was in, you know, in, in, in separate from the high school project. Um, it wasn't at this stage of the project that it came up. It was after money had been appropriated and they just peeled the whole thing off. And in terms of like the library where it is more, uh, you know, happening at this simultaneously, there had been an extensive effort already to fundraise and money on hand and a real ability to commit as the town was asked for its portion. So I just, I, that's where it sort of swirled for me and I don't have the answers beyond that. Um, but those seem to be some of the questions that would have to get answered as to process and procedure. Yeah, the Fields Project is another one uh, where it was the town uh, community preservation committee, uh, private funding that all got together and, and 
provided funding for the field project, the turf fields. Correct. So it's certainly possible. I get the, the time frame. Um, I think there's probably wherewithal within the community. Um, the question is how quickly it could be rallied. So I think having some of those conversations is important too. I did talk with um, another leader in youth sports and you know the impression I got was it could be rallied quickly, but how quickly is hard to be sure. <laughs> so, yeah. I, I have a second you know, observation, I guess, observation slash question. Um, we have in the past uh, had some level of discussion about the rec department. And when I, when I read those requirements about separate HVAC and you know, separate court access externally and so forth, it, it, it simply reminded me of BD and the way the town handled the BD requirement, I thought was, was pretty exceptional that the rec department was involved, that the town uh, privately raised money, that the money was, was fundamentally passed to, uh, to the, the rec department uh, as a, I suppose, as sort of a trust fund. And then the, the people who gave that money kind of stepped back and it became the responsibility of the rec department. So now we have a, a uh, we have BD that basically manages all those monies that are coming in, handles the insurance, staffing, and so forth. So I, you know, that's the way it came across to me. And I, you know, I've raised that in the past. And I think that uh, discussion, you know, needs to kind of be uh, brought to some sort of conclusion um, as we go through the governance and the funding and those sorts of issues. Susan, I see you have your hand up. Um, Yes, thank you. Um, it, it, just in reference to the public part, private partnership, that would be um, something that the select board would have um, uh, jurisdiction over. So just to clarify that one minor point. Thank you, Susan. Um, Charlie, related to the separate HVAC and entrances, architecturally, some of that occurs anyway. Like you often have the gym on its own zone and its own units that you can operate that off hours, off school hours, if you will. And then as far as entrances, it's a somewhat, e I don't wanna say easy, but you can certainly have a community entrance and then they're inherently gonna have um, doors that are kind of in the corners <laughs> to allow for uh, the proper amount of exiting that one could have access to direct into the gym after hours if needed. So from an architectural standpoint, those, those asks don't scare me as much as like a whole separate space versus a larger gym that's subdividable. So that's just commenting on that. Yeah, to Dawn's point, what you're, what I think you're saying, Dawn, is it could function like a separate building on weekends and so forth, but not be constructed as such, uh, which is a big very, difference. Big difference. Very in common. Site yep. coverage and costs and so forth. Thank you. Don. Very common to design it that way. So it's capable of doing that. And we're not the first school to have that desire. Almost every school has the desire to use it at night or on weekends and sort of separately. And whether that means a direct entrance or an entrance that's lockable that you can't get into the rest of the building, but you can, you know, get into the gym and of course out safely. So that's, that's common. So can I ask a question about kind of big picture and process here? Because I think this this is a really important point and discussion and and yes we're all sitting here this morning hoping to vote on a space summary but but this is a really big question. Um, so in terms of process, how could we conceivably go forward if we don't want to totally cut off this option yet of a larger gym is is that an option today to you know whether it's with the space summary that's being recommended to us or an edited version, is it, is it possible to continue on with the, the, the general plan we have, but with two potential gym sizes? Or is that out of the question right now? You know, could we conceivably end up with two potential space concepts? You know, treetops one and treetops two, one that has a larger gym and one, one that has the 7,000 square. And I get, I'm just asking these questions to understand how can we move forward on this if there are still some questions that don't have answers? I think you have it, Heather. This is about 
the general conceptual design and the massing of that design is going to dictate uh, what we can do. Um, when you hear from the design subcommittee, you're going to hear that uh, the design subcommittee uh, really you know, took pains to uh, not compromise the ed plan at all. Right, um, which is and, a priority. And, and so that's why we're in the squeeze that we're in for space and for uh, financing this for, for budget. Uh, it only leaves us the question, how, uh, how much flexibility do we have in our concept thinking and our massing whereby this would even be possible? We don't even have the answer to that yet, if I'm correct. Money aside for a moment. I mean, we could ask SMMA in their, um, you know, in the iteration where they take this, the, you know, hopefully what is recommended today, if we approve it, to take that space template and come up with, you know, an update or a new floor plan for consideration. And as part of that, it could be as simple as showing a dashed line of the gym that would show then the outer extents. What that means as far as the 15%, it could be literally that simple. <laughs> just, just say here's 7,070 by 100 and here's, I would say 10 or 11,000. I don't know how much you get in bleacher with that. I've done two MIA cross courts um, with that, but it's tight um, without bleachers. So, you know, to understand what the, the footprint would do, I guess where we may run into issues is the 15% and how that impacts the rest of the building. Meaning do, you know, core content classrooms have to go up a floor because we need to squeeze that footprint in order to be under the 15%. So I think that's the bigger in my mind, if I'm look, you know, as a designer, I'm like, okay, that would be the bigger hurdle to get through than just showing the outline of what a bigger gym would be for now and to be able to move forward without a decision necessarily today. Yeah, if, if, if we're, if, Dawn, if we're not uh, already challenged enough, uh, we're told by proponents of a larger auditorium that we're gonna continue to hear more from them too. So I hate to say it, but uh, this, this is gonna get more challenging, not less. <laughs> No classrooms on the on the <laughs> lower level. <laughs> All gym auditorium. Maybe the cafeteria goes upstairs. I've done it that way. So it just you know, we have very creative architects. I'm sure they can figure something out. It's just we need to get to what that footprint can be and understand. Maybe then we back into what is besides any gym or auditorium at the greater size. Start with the worst case scenario. Back into what's left and then see, you know, what that does for us from a footprint volume standpoint. I'd hate to go to four stories or something crazy, you know, just to be able to meet that, but ha not having the information, I don't even know where that puts us. Um, so maybe we should, so is Lorraine, it? Lorraine can speak to it a little bit and she and I are on the same page with this. And, and the short answer is we can definitely explore it, but Lorraine, I don't know if you wanna elaborate. Hey, Lorraine. Hi, how are you? I haven't seen many of Good. you. Hi, everybody. Yeah, welcome. Um, so I, you know, I've been following this with Kristen back in the office, and I know these are challenging decisions for you, as they are with any community. But I think, you know, the ask that Laurie read out is simply not possible. I'm going to be the bad cop here today. The second full gym with six hoops is simply not possible within your budget and maintaining what you need for your educational plan. So I think Chris had the perfect idea, which is what Dawn was saying, and it's something we've done on many projects. What can we get? How incremental can it be? as we start to develop the, the new footprint based around the defined space summary, keeping in mind the 15%, what those trade-offs are, but what can you get? I think sitting here today, hearing a full size, another full size gym with six hoops, that means it's fully enclosed and separate. So that is not possible within your budget, within your 15% constraints, um, without impacting the educational plan. And, and it just needs to be stated. But I think what schematic design is about is exploring the concept. What is the base needed for the educational plan? What are the options, or as sometimes we call them in the architectural world, alternates that can be accommodated? We had our North Middlesex High School project where they wanted an additional 3,000 square feet on the gym. One of the beauties of the gymnasium, better or worse, is it's typically on the exterior of the building. It's not embedded. So you can show those incremental increases and what does that mean? In the end in North Middlesex, the community decided that they weren't gonna fund it on the project, but what we did is maintain that site space for future. So we ran no duct work, no uh, electrical, no plumbing, no services, no sanitary, no drainage, nothing within that dedicated zone. 
and left the community the option that in the future, could they extend it? They could. We designed it that way, that that end wall could be taken down and expanded. We sized the HVAC and the cooling and the electrical for that expanded space. So I think we need to keep in mind what we can accomplish. Can we accomplish it now? And if we can't accomplish it now, how can we plan for the future if that's possible? And so that we plan it both from a site perspective and a building perspective. But I think it is super critical that people remember we're building a middle school and the adjacency of the educational spaces needs to come before how many hoops are in the gym. I, again, I'm gonna be the bad cop here today, but you know, we are architects, we can come up with ideas, we can do concepts, but we need to understand what the driving criteria is and then bring the options and the trade-offs to you so that you can make an informed decision. If, if I may, Lorraine, I, 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 I preach bad cop, but I like the term realism. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Thank you, Lorraine and Chris. Stephen, yes, yeah. I, hi. Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, I guess good morning. The, the old, and hearing Charlie with the, you know, and we've known for a while that there were going to be some intersection points here, or I guess I don't want to use the word conflict points, but there were going to be some, some competing interests that are all um, justifiable on their own, in their own merit, in their own right. Um, without a doubt, people want uh, additional gym space and that's not unique to Concord. Uh, and I think it is a great community benefit. Um, and I, so Peter, um, I agree with you on that. Uh, you know, it's, we want a building that is, you know, leading and sustainable. Um, we want an auditorium. I was, I was an early on advocate for a, for going forward on the auditorium for possible town meeting, um, you know, capacity. That's, you know, is that likely? I don't know. I think, you know, Court, to, to, your, to your point, the way I view the role of this committee is to um, find balance in all of these things. Uh, we committed to the Finance Committee, I seem to recall, that we were going to deliver a feasibility study that included a building that was on budget, um, on or under. I mean, there was discussion of 2% uh, haircut at the design subcommittee as well. I don't think that came forward as a recommendation, but it was certainly a good conversation. And so I think for the, for the people, and I re received them all as well, and thank you, Pat, for, for taking the time to respond to everybody. I just think we as a committee need to tell the community, we hear you, uh, we share your values, but our job is going to be to find a balancing point between all of those factors, which means no one, no one interest is going to get all that it wants. Uh, and I just, you know, I, I so I, I'm trying to, you know, see if we can move forward, basically saying there are some things that we're just going to have to, you know, um, push back on a little bit. Um, but I think as we go through the completion of feasibility and schematic design, that, that fulcrum, that balance point may move a little bit, you know, side to side, but I think we'll still find it in a way that makes sense for all of the, all of the areas that we're talking about. Stephen, I agree with Stephen. everything you say, um, except I would just add that it's not just, I don't think I agree with no one interest um, because there is an interest here that I think we have to hold really, uh, give the maximum amount of weight to. We're building a middle school that, you know, we want to have the best educational program that we can, can possibly have. Um, and if there's a way to do that with, with building a bigger gym or building a bigger auditorium, I, I'm all for it. But the weight goes to, in my opinion, building a middle school. I, I, I guess I was looking at beyond the education plan. Yeah. I think we, we do have an obligation to make sure we have the most efficient education plan that meets the educational needs of the, of the district. Yeah. Um, but beyond that, I, I agree. And I almost thought it was going to be too good to be true when you said you agree with everything I said. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I see Heather's hand. Peter, was your hand up as well? If so, I'll, I'll come to you after Heather. Yes, Heather. Thanks. Um, I just, I, I want to echo the, folk, the, the, the priority on education plan first, and I don't want that to get lost here at all. Um, you know, if the 15 percent meant that in order to do a larger gym, we were all of a sudden cutting into educational space. That's a non-starter. It's not even a question to me. Um, so not an option at all. Um, the, the one thing when I referenced earlier, what can we do here if some questions are unanswered? 
that I want to just tease out a little more is is the possibility of a variance. And I understand in order to ask for a variance, you need a plan. Um, and so I guess part of my question is when you referenced Don, you know, a plan with a dotted line for a larger gym, is that the type of thing that we could consider considerably look at as a, you know, it, it, the dotted line version works if we get a variance. And if not, we did our best it, to, in order to avoid cutting into that educational space. And so th could that be a way that we have the, the regular version and the dotted line version, and we put a dotted line version forward, even if it's a rough draft, you know, to, to get a, an initial read on a variance? Is that, is that a thing? I, I'm not exactly sure how that process works, but I just wanted to throw that out there as a, as a way to continue to answer questions or get a read on questions, because I think that's a big one. Yeah, and I don't have an answer for you, Heather. I actually have a follow-up question, which is at what point can you ask for a variance? I haven't been through that process here in town. Is it schematic design? Are they permit drawings? Like those are very different things. <laughs> so if it's that schematic design, I think that's an easy ask because you can have a footprint with a dotted line that shows if it's permit drawings, that's a bigger issue. And in my mind, pretty far along in the process. So I will say, sorry, go ahead, sorry. Kristen. First of all, I did want to mention that we did have that meeting with town staff and because there is no existing nonconformance, they were very strong about saying they are not likely to proceed with a variance. So I think it would be a huge risk if you designed the, the floor plans around a, a plan that is in excess of the 15% lot coverage. Um, the timing of the request would be with the permit drawings, which is also very far down the road. Um, and so in and so can this be accommodated within the 15%? Yes, the impacts will be the educational adjacencies will have less flexibility. That's it, because you are committing to a certain scope on a grade level footprint. So it can be done within the 15%, but we have not seen how that plays out throughout the building. And we could test that in the concept development, certainly. And it may be that it works out perfectly. Um, but I just want to present that using treetop teams, even in a compressed version with the updates, um, we, we are at that 15% with the current program assumptions. So it would mean what you had seen previously, even consolidated, would need to be uh, adapted. Here's what I'm going to suggest in an effort to move things along, is that we go through the space template now. That's the next thing on the agenda talk through what the recommendations from the design subcommittee and also the sustainability subcommittee is, recognizing that as you hopefully are taking those into design concepts, you'll continue to look at what the impact is. And it's as simple as a dotted line on the, you know, and if there's too much in scenarios that we're happy with of an educational impact, I think it's a non-starter to other people's points. But if it's something that there's, possibly a concept out there that we don't even know about that we're going to fall in love with that allows for it. I don't know. The, the, op, you know, the opportunities are endless. So I guess what I'm going to ask you guys to do is to consider that as you move forward into new concepts, just so that we don't, and I'm sorry to be vague and to still keep this out there and not have a final, final decision, but I don't think we can make that decision without the data that says, here's the impact, whether it's from a, a footprint, square footage number or an educational impact. Um, so would that be possible? And I'm looking at Lorraine and Kristen. <laughs> I think um, we need to talk with our team, keep it very high level conceptual. I mean, That's what I'm, yes. conceptual, yep. um, to just understand it. So I think we can look at that. And that's all I'd expect at this point. I mean, everything's fairly um, conceptual, and right. we're, we're in con we're technically in the conceptual phase. Exactly. Yep. You know, some very block diagrams. Just, sorry, just kids sorry. are off to school. Sorry, <laughs> I'm distracted. Um, just, just on the phasing. I, I mean, my understanding is we are trying to enter schematic design is that where we are uh, because I guess I'm, I'm keying in on the slide with the bullet that said if private funding were an option that should be in place prior to schematic design we need to finish feasibility 
which means taking the space template and having concepts that come out of it. That doesn't, at, at, some, at the end of feasibility, you want to move a concept forward into schematic design. And at that point you do deeper drawings that have more content. So you get a better cost estimate, better as in more refined. Um, so we still have to get to that cut in, uh, you know, this, the evolution of the education plan and the space template doesn't have us too far off from where we were last year without some of that information. So I think the um, goal of SMMA, and I don't want to speak for you, but what I'd expect is a refinement of the treetops, which everyone was on board with and liked, and possibly another option or two that, you know, says here's something else to consider to move us into SD. So we're not quite there yet, Matt, if that answers your question. And Kristen or Lorraine, if you guys want to speak to where you are in the process, I'm just saying generally we're not at physically at the end of feasibility quite yet. Perfect, thank you. Sure. Okay, um, let's move on. Um, that was a good discussion and I think it needed to happen. So I'm sorry that took up quite a bit of time and hopefully people have left a little bit of flexibility on time. I don't wanna shortchange any of the recommendations either. Um, but I think first is a sustainability. Am I seeing that right? Yep. Um, sustainability subcommittee recommendation. So Matt, I think you were going to say a few words and have a few slides. Yep. And I think the how we're going to do this um, is to go through the sustainability subcommittee recommendation, go through the design subcommittee recommendation, and then have discussion about it is my understanding. Do I have that correct, Kristen? Yes. Is that the expectation? Yep. I'll sh uh, yep. So I can share the sustainability slides now and turn it over. To Perfect. Matt. Great. Take it away, Matt. Super. Uh, thank you, Don. Thank you, Kristen. Um, I do unfortunately have a hard nine o'clock stop by a meeting that was scheduled not by May, so I will be jumping off. Um, I will make this quick. Uh, the sustainability subcommittee meeting uh, or committee met last uh, last week and unanimously approved uh, a set of recommendations, which. Uh, breaks down into to three kind of chunks here that you'll see. Uh, this first slide just represents some updates to uh, charter language that we had developed at the beginning of 2020 prior, prior to COVID. Uh, so we just made some small tweaks to the language, but these are kind of, the, you'll see two bullet points here, and these are kind of the guiding principles that the sustainability subcommittee are operating under. And this, this document will be shared, the document that we approved will be shared uh, after this meeting. So I'm not gonna, gonna read through these. Uh, the, the separate, uh, the second section uh, that we approved was these six high level goals. Um, they focus on indoor air quality, education, uh, energy efficiency and uh, being solar ready. I know that there's been a lot of discussion within the, the community about uh, this, uh, this, this term of being ready for it without necessarily installing all specifically PV. Um, we as the subcommittee feel like uh, the, at this point, the best path to installing PV would be through CMLP. And uh, that is an avenue that, that we don't have direct control over. And uh, so we are definitely have a commitment to getting there and we will fully explore that option, um, but are not ready to go beyond the, the use of the word ready at this point. We wanna be, we want to be ready for the installation of that in the, in the future. Um, you'll see there's the footnote where we highlight uh, the, the, the items or the goals that align with uh, the amendment to the original funding uh, for, this, for this project. Uh, the, the next section that we want to show here is we've defined some metrics around how we achieve those, those six goals. Uh, we went through a lot of iterations on what these metrics might be. We had a very big, ugly, long spreadsheet originally, uh, but we, we found a, a way forward to, to consolidate and, and simplify our, our 
the the metrics in which we'll be using to to, to focus on on achieving the sustainability goals. And uh, the big one is compliance with the energy zero uh, code. Now, I, I want to emphasize with everyone, this is this is a proposed energy code within the, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. This hasn't been approved uh, through that process yet, but it has gone through uh, a very extensive public process. It has gotten lots of uh, feedback and comments from many constituents within the construction industry. And uh, so we feel that this proposed code uh, has been kind of rigorously reviewed and uh, is in line with the goals of, of achieving a very efficient building and, and getting the project on a path to being uh, net zero energy. Uh, we, have, we have specifically made a, made a couple notes to the code. We have focused on the prescriptive path uh, as opposed to doing performance modeling, uh, that is based on on discussions with SMMA. They already have to do energy modeling to meet the what is the code and the law of the land with the stretch energy code, um, and it, it's a different baseline. So we didn't want there to be confusion there. We're just trying to simplify it and focus on. Uh, uh, the performance path, which is, or so, I'm sorry, the prescriptive path, which is, which is as it, as it's titled, very, uh, very prescriptive in the measurements, but that looks at air infiltration, uh, insulation, heating load limits, uh, all of, all of the metrics that, that make and deliver a, an efficient building. Uh, we've also pulled out a, a couple other sections and I've just listed the numbers there, uh, but that gets into uh, retro commissioning, the installation of, of, of solar panels or renewable energy systems. Um, and as I mentioned, we're, we're at this point willing to go up to, to solar ready, but not, not full solar installation. Uh, so that is, the, that is the big metric that we're really focusing on is, is compliance with the, the easy code. We have a, a few more, uh, again, all in support of those six sustainability goals with regards to indoor air quality, uh, daylighting, because uh, that has such great impact on, on education and is already in line with the, the, the treetops layout. Uh, we're also hope to focus on embodied carbon and, and have set a, a, a modest metric of reducing the embodied carbon by, by 20%. Um, and then there's also the, the whole lead checklist um, and the, the certifiability of, of that program, uh, which has already been baked into uh, our, our, the RFP and, uh, and SMMA's design, so. Quick summary. I'm happy to to jump into any specifics after uh, after after court goes. Thank you, Matt. Oh, out of respect for your time, Matt, do we want to go to your Q and A first? Oh, good point, Court. Thank you for that because Matt does have to jump off in 20 minutes. Does anyone? Do we want to have discussion about that? I'm sorry, I did hear you say you needed to. You have a hard stop. Thank you, Court, and I, I am sorry for having another meeting. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> Are you? <laughs> I'm just laughing because that's where everyone's at right now. Um, so, okay, so let's do that then. Thank you, Court, for suggesting that. That's um, good. Do we want to have discussion about these recommendations? Do folks have questions? Um, I did ask, just so everyone knows, I sent around the links to last Friday's sustainability subcommittee meeting as well as Thursday's design um, subcommittee meeting since everything's on Zoom and recorded these days, I did ask that folks maybe if you have some time to um, review those, if you couldn't participate and have some homework and or questions um, that if you were ready to bring them forward to the larger committee today, please speak up. Hey, John. Question. Yes, um, I'm sorry. sorry. Could we, hold on one second. Kristen, are you sharing? Could you go to the, um, could you stop sharing just for the sake of discussion? If we need to go back to the slides, we will, but I just want to be able to see people who was trying to speak. Thank you, Kristen. 
I just have a quick question, and maybe Krista can answer this. The, the sort of the cost estimate of what is it, 375 a square foot, is that based, does that include these sustainability recommendations? So um, it includes a um, EUI of thirty of twenty five or better, and the net zero ready approach. These are more specific metrics that the sustainability sub subcommittee drilled down to. That we're actually we're going to use to inform some design decisions, mm -hmm. but uh, we've said that they are targets, and we cannot commit to them necessarily each individually because there are trade offs, like greater daylighting may in fact in impact your EUI and everything. So it's kind of, um, our commitment remains the same to net zero ready and EUI of 25 or better. The, the list of metrics I think is going to be what we need to continue to review with the sustainability subcommittee, but we, but we do plan on continuing with them as targets. And that will be informed by life cycle cost analysis, Kristen? Exactly, exactly. Okay. And daylight modeling and energy, mo it, a lot <laughs> of modeling. And can you tell the committee at what point that all happens? During schematic or begins? design. Yep, during schematic design. So by the end of schematic design, we would be looking to have uh, provided sufficient information to the sustainability subcommittee to be comfortable with any trade-offs of those items in favor of other items, you know, if, if all can't be achieved within the budget or because of you, we have a we have an example of of Lincoln uh, our Lincoln project where um, changes to the uh, eight, uh, to the filter from a MERV sixteen uh, thirteen to a MERV sixteen dropped the EUI so so we need to have conversations about that in schematic design through modeling um, before and then at the end of schematic de design we'll have a full level of comfort with what can be achieved and how but we don't want to tell you. You can have an EUI of 25 if there are going to be decisions that are made that impact that um, in favor of others. And it's at the end of schematic design that we have an estimate that gives us a number that we bring forward to the voters and the Correct. community. So it's prior to those that major milestone, but you know there, a lot happens in between. Just so everyone has a full understanding of when that occurs. Great, but, thank you. But, but just to jump, I mean. At a, at a high level from cost and based on the, the now kind of outdated initial cost modeling that was done, these, these goals are, are kind of in line with the, the, the costs that were developed previously and, and are included in the current, um, the, 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 the current 550 per square foot kind of cost analysis, right, Kristen? Yeah, it, again, it goes back to the EV charging stations, I think, in particular. I think that's a, set as a goal for easy code, and, and we do not have that in the budget. Yeah, I, I guess, I yeah. mean, maybe my, my big point, I, I, our expectation is not that any of these metrics will suddenly increase the budget by 25% or increase the, the additional cost. We don't think there's, there's big there's big changes in the, the current cost analysis based on these metrics and goals. Yeah, we, would agree. we would agree to that. We just, uh, the numerics of the metrics, we just yep. don't want to be um, handcuffed yep. to without further study. Right, I, I just also don't want the full committee to think that by voting to move these forward, they're also approving is suddenly a big, a big increase in the budget. Correct. Yep, we agree with that. And from where I sit, Matt, nothing on this scares me as far as that's concerned. So, and but I'm not the designer, but you know, I, I as I listened to, I listened on Friday and again today, and nothing jumps out at me as like, oh my gosh, we can't do that or we can't somehow incorporate that. So I think these are pretty realistic um, goals. So, any other comments, Stephen Crane? Yeah, so I just wanted to touch base, uh, and I'm stepping on Kate Hamley's toes here a little bit, but. Um, <laughs> One of the things that we decided, um, Kate and Dave Wood from CMLP and I decided was to uh, engage a solar designer um, because we're looking at the solar, you can't do a solar array without a battery. That's CMLP policy now because of solar saturation and grid inelasticity and all these other things. And so our view and, and I, our view is that we should at least look at this initially as a CMLP project attached to a middle school 
instead of uh, a solar and battery project as part of a middle school building project. CMLP would control the battery, they would get the generation from the panels and it would just be uh, almost, almost like a third party PPA, but because it is a town building, we felt CMLP should be the developer of the solar and the battery. Um, and so to make sure that the design decisions we make here for the building um, through schematic, they, through, the, through the duration, uh, we have someone engaged uh, at, at CMLP's end to make sure that there is design integration with what we think we can do um, for the array and the battery. So um, I just wanna basically offer to take off the table the idea that the project budget needs to carry the battery and the array. Um, we view it as the, the utility should um, own that. And so that's the approach that we're looking at. I hope, you know, I hope that would be okay with the committee. Um, I think CMLP supports that approach as well. And I just wanted to kind of throw that out there. I'm just speaking for myself, but I think that's great news <laughs> and <that> is very helpful. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thank you, Stephen and Kate for spearheading that and um, assume that they'll work in conjunction along the way. So any decisions that are infrastructure related and required, they can intertwine that. So when it comes time for installation and operation, it's ready to go. Yeah, we have a we have a solar design consultant that, that CMLP works with. I said Kate is coordinating that part of it. Um, but shortly after we get them get them or somebody else on board, we'll um, put in touch with Kristen uh, and Lorraine and, and Peter from Hill and and just sort of plug in, pun intended, uh, on where we are in the design. Great. Do you know what a, a third party is right now? Because we're working with a few other third party solar vendors. Not yet. Okay. Uh, Kate, I don't know if you, I don't remember the name off the top of my head. They did have somebody, but we can, certainly if you've got somebody you work with, I, yep. we can talk to them as well. We, don't, we haven't signed a, an agreement or anything. We're just, okay. just step one. We just thought hearing the discussion um, from sustainability and from the design subcommittee, uh, I think we just felt like rather than have this be kind of something hanging over the project as an uncertainty, let's just kind of nail it down now that uh, CMLP wants to, wants to do this part of it. That's great. And from, back to the Mothers Out Front correspondence, I think one of their asks was that it be, you know, at the start of the, pro the opening of the building and that, you know, and I think that was something we were clear on at the community forum that that may not be possible just given our budget constraints. So I think that may ease some of um, the constituents yeah. minds as far as how that will unfold. So that's yeah, great. The goal, yeah, the goal, the goal is to have the system designed. Um, so, you know, and maybe we can procure and have it, have there be some synchronicity to the opening of the building and the system coming online, but at least we don't want to have the paint drying on the school and then starting the design process. Right. Great. Anything else on either what Stevens brought up or Matt's um, and his subcommittee's recommendations? Nothing. That's exciting. So everyone's on board. <laughs> okay. Well, that makes it easy. Excellent. Thank you. I want to say um, thank you to the whole sustainability subcommittee. You guys have worked really hard, um, both preparing for your meetings and understanding um, what's possible here and being realistic about, you know, what can be put into the middle school. So thank you everyone for your time and your energy and Matt for chairing. Um, I know it's not easy. So thank you. No, yeah, thank you to everyone on the subcommittee. I think we did a we did a great job and, and got to a great place. Uh, I'll also point, it's not in the slides, but there is, for anyone who looks at the future document, there is a long list, laundry list of, of items that we plan to dig into uh, so the community can see the, the items that, that, that we're going to start to to look at next. I mean, I know I can only speak for myself, but I know we're in good hands as far as sustainability is concerned um, with you guys at the helm. So thank you. All right, well, if that's all on the sustainability recommendation, thank you for that. Court, you ready to yeah, do absolutely. design? Uh, Excellent. I think our best process might be to simply share with you our recommendations to date, and then, uh, then give you some, some context to it uh, following that. Uh, I think that'd be a, a good order. So Kristen will pull those up for us, if you'd be so kind.
So uh, we have been meeting frequently. Uh, I don't think any of the members would consider the work easy, uh, but it wasn't uh, intended to be easy. This was tough stuff. Um, we uh, bring to you today, one, the uh, gym sizing at uh, the current 7,000 net. Uh, secondly, the auditorium at the one grade uh, or 270 seat level. Uh, third, the alt PE room at uh, 1,600, uh, providing a third teaching space, uh, albeit largely unscheduled, uh, likely to be used uh, for a variety of purposes. Uh, four, the maker space as a, a room in and of itself. And finally, that uh, the remainder of the recommendations in the uh, recent SMMA space summary be also moved to this committee for consideration. Uh, the one vote that was not unanimous was the sizing of the media center at uh, 3,400 square feet. And that, uh, that recommendation for that, uh, <clears throat> that spacing or sizing uh, does move forward uh, with a uh, majority vote. Uh, I think that uh, it would be accurate, although very general, very simplified to say that uh, there, there were two, two camps in the group uh, as we approach the final stages. One was uh, pushing on the question, can we give the the budget a two to five percent haircut, as Stephen said, uh, with some consolidations. Uh, and uh, uh, the second camp was don't touch the ed plan, uh, see that we have lots of flexibility. We, I think every member would agree, didn't compromise the ed plan in, in any way, shape or form. Uh, we shared concerns about utilization numbers, uh, variances against MSBA and benchmarks that we had chosen uh, that make us look uh, very favorable in terms of space for children in that building. Uh, and we were always cognizant of the fact that our uh, budget uh, projections right now put us at the upper limit of the town meeting uh, authorization and expectation. We did seek consolidations and came up with uh, very, very minor gains. Uh, these happened not at the tail end. No changes were made at, at the end of our process. Um, but earlier on, uh, we did see that uh, scheduling of some health and digital literacy classes uh, are gonna now occur in the nine core neighborhoods or five room configurations, the nine five room configurations for the teams um, that uh, constituted uh, the most recent consolidation. And uh, we knew all, all the way through this that uh, our, our charge was to bring recommendations to you, uh, quote, inclusive of community use, unquote. Uh, we were very sensitive to this and yet at the same time, uh, came to the conclusion we didn't have room to do that uh, more than we have done already with the 7,000 and the one grade auditorium unless we were to have further consolidation of the ed plan, higher utilization of scheduled rooms, um, and uh, 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 lesser variances with our benchmarks. And we, we didn't go there. We didn't do that. And then finally, what we didn't do was look at the, what I'll call the adult only space. And that was simply because we ran out the clock. We, we, we didn't have time. And so I wanna note that uh, this committee should uh, pay attention to that as well, because that's not an insignificant part of the building, but it was one that we didn't weigh in uh, on in any way, shape or form, or even study to great the degree. We, we devoted ourselves to student facing space. Uh, so if you want to perhaps criticize our process or say there was a, an oversight or a run out of time, uh, uh, I'll take a responsibility for that and say sorry, but uh, know that that is work uh, yet to be done if this committee wants to attend to that, uh, that aspect of the building. 
and that's what we've got. I, I'd certainly add uh, that uh, other members might have uh, different opinions or clarification or expanded uh, uh, perspectives on this. If, if you'll grant us that, Dawn, if people want to, to weigh in. Sure, I'd like to say one thing and then I'm open to other comments and or questions um, for you and the design subcommittee on the um, statement about the two camps and the, the haircut as Stephen called it and I chuckled when he said that earlier. Um, <laughs> that's a good analogy. Um, it was brought up that this, um, this size building would put us at the higher end of our 80 to 100 budget, which we're all sensitive to. Um, but the feeling that the um, spaces should be cut in order to provide some relief or some comfort in being farther under the high end. Uh, I know I, and, I, and I'm only speaking as myself and a design subcommittee member, felt like that was a um, conversation that should be had at the larger committee. I didn't feel like that was um, the task or the charge of the design subcommittee. We're charged with, you know, looking at the spaces from an educational plan and meeting the educational plan does this size building do that? And um, so I kind of made the um, case for, you know, it would, it would be a tragedy if we were to cut spaces now, because we're never going to get them back for the sake of trying to, to, to give a haircut, <laughs> to use Stephen's analogy, um, and then find later that potentially we're still on budget, maybe we'd be under budget, and um, but our building wouldn't meet the educational plan. So I felt like, um, and again, just me, uh, it was the charge of the design subcommittee to put forward a building space and space says that meet the educational plan. So um, that's just my perspective. So I'm open to others, other comments and questions, anything for court or the larger committee. Yes, Heather. So I just want to I, I want to touch on what you said about there. There is some buffer, as we'd say, built into this, correct? Yes, there are um, contingencies. And, yes. Okay. Um, and so my leaning overall is that where we are right now. Correct me if I'm wrong. My understanding is that if if we do that haircut now, that that hair stops growing and we can't ever get it back if we need it. And that in schematic design, we can adjust and shave things down if need be. And so my gut reaction is to be careful of just cutting something for the sake of cutting now when that, when that means it can be gone forever and we have the opportunity to, to adjust things later. So, so I'm hesitant to do any overall, well, we want to be 2% under, so let's just cut something for the sake of cutting it when those could be important things that we could keep in. So anyway, my two cents. Thank you, Heather. My experience is the hair never grows back, but that's um, it. just me as a designer doing this. So um, if Kristen or Lorraine or feel differently, but in my experience, and I do this even when I've had to make design decisions, I try to never cut things out, but maybe reduce things. But it's different when it comes to program because you're not, you're not going to be able to in SD say, hey, let's add 2,000 more square feet back because we're under. Like that, I've never had that happen. Did I see Matt's hand? Matt, where'd you go? I lost you on my screen. I Oh, maybe he was waving goodbye. He had to leave. Waving goodbye. Okay. I thought he had a question. I was going to try and get to him. Okay. Um, I see Peter's hand. Yes. Yeah. I, I would just uh, echo that, that um, I think I've seen, again, I go back to the experience with a number <laughs> of projects and seeing that a focus, uh, and I'm saying this as a former finance committee member, but uh, the, the focus on a number is very important. However, it, it should not be the guiding force for the design. Uh, it should be a, a, a guide to help us design around, but we need to get this right. And, and the town of Concord, uh, my experience is that when we cut corners to try to save a few bucks, it comes back to bite us. And I'd rather do this once, do it right, have the community say, yes, it was, the, it was an expensive project. It's gonna be an expensive project no matter what, but
but not have to go back to them and say, well, yeah, it's not ideal. We had to cut this, we had to cut that. Obviously there's decisions made and, and we'll show them that thoughtful process, but let's not uh, get so focused that we're, we're cutting programs that we, we need. Thank you, Pete. Oh, sorry. I was just going to say thank you and very um, a great response from a new but clearly experienced member. Yes, Court. Yeah, Peter, I want to assure you there was no no discussion uh, ever uh, expressed or implied of, of program cuts or program reductions. Uh, nothing at all. Uh, the program is intact. It was rather about uh, space and utilization and how care now might reduce or even avoid, but might reduce uh, regrettable value engineering later that would take a beautiful school and uh, make, it, make it a lesser school at the tail end. That's, uh, that was a consideration as well, not, not program. Don? Yes, Stephen? I guess yeah, the other thing I'd say to, to Court's comments, to this before, I, you know, it, I, and I, I think part of our work as well is going to be as we get through design, it's not, as clean, or cl as clean or simple as it as it sounds, but as we get further, if when if we get further into the design, there will be an evaluation of certain aspects of the project that can be looked at as bid alternates as a way to kind of lower the curve on certain elements. Now, like the larger gym isn't a ad alternate type thing because it's a, it's a fun, it's a foundational thing. So we have to be a little bit, you know, expectations management in terms of what can be a bit alternate and what can't be. Um, the difference in the filters is something like that, you know, that, that type of detail that can drive cost. So I, I want to also say that the decision, if we make a decision here now on the recommendation of design subcommittee, that doesn't foreclose the opportunity to use the bid alternate process as a way to try and reduce cost or, know what certain upgrades are worth that's honestly. and i'm so that's a good sorry. point i'm so sorry i used that colloquialism about the haircut that was <laughs> no i laughed it was good <laughs> i just wondered if uh, lorraine or Kristen could just speak to for for someone who doesn't know this process um particularly well when we do get to schematic um in in reference to court's concern that you know we we start to value engineer and we we Kind of change the whole get into messiness with with our our vision for the school could you just speak to what can happen in schematic design that can help to adjust the cost of the building without messing with the with the program yeah so I think, you know I, i'll start Kristen, and then you can fill me in i think the program and space are, are two words that we use and they're not exactly the same, but they're also so related. A program is an educational delivery that needs a space in which to occur. So I think it's, it's important when we say we're not cutting programs, what we mean is we're not cutting, you know, an educational delivery component, but we are cutting space in which to provide that program. So that's important. So I think, you know, we're, once we get into schematic design, what we look at is we do a whole nother round of programming with the teachers. We get into more detail on the educational adjacencies, what can work together. We, you know, as Don said, some of those circulation spaces start to tighten up. What we're not doing is we're not removing programmed space in schematic design. We're tightening up on our efficiency, on our multiplier of um, the non uh, non-programmed space, and this is where the words become very funny, but not the classrooms, not the teacher planning rooms, but the circulation around that and to get to it. You know, does creating, adding the maker space right next to the media center, is there an efficiency there where, you know, maybe the media center ends up just a little bit smaller, a little bit bigger, and the maker space gets a little bit smaller. It all depends on where they land in the floor plan. So there are efficiencies to occur. I would say not probably within the net square footage, but it is within the grossing factor. And the, the organization of the plan and the massing of the plan add to that. What Stephen was mentioning for value engineering and, and alternates, there a lot of that comes to materiality. You know, what is the choice of materials we're putting on the building? What is the choice of um, the amount of insulation we're putting in the roofs and the walls? That's again gonna all be a balancing act when it comes to meeting an EUI of 25 and all these sustainable goals, because with every inch of insulation you add or remove, you know, you're affecting those numbers. 
So there will be trade-offs. I will say, Stephen, we did do an alternate of an expanded gym on a project. Um, it was, but it was, it was, you know, extending out one end. So, you know, if it is, if it approaches something like that, that'll be something that we look at. Um, adding a whole nother gym building is a bit more tricky, to be quite honest. So there are steps, incremental steps that we look at, Pat, as we go through that. But really, the efficiency is going to occur in our multipliers, in our footprint, in our materiality choices. But the defined program space that is our net square footage is what we need to deliver on in order for you to deliver your educational plan. Thank you. Sure. Okay, I just want to be sensitive to time. It's 9.07 and <laughs> we did, we went over last meeting, we're going over this meeting. I have some comments at the end that I'd like to propose as far as um, getting us through this very um, intense part of the, the design process. So I'll get to those after we finish up this discussion. Um, any other questions for court, the design subcommittee, our designers, anyone? related to space and space template and what's being recommended today. Sounds like no, I don't see any hands. Okay. Well, sorry, yeah. Don, in terms of what's Thanks, being, sorry, in terms of what's being recommended on the full space summary, and I'm not looking back at each other now, I mean, but when mm -hmm. we get to this vote of the space summary, um, and maybe this is the comments you were talking about, but I think we need to kind of get back to an answer around what we were talking about. Are we really just voting this space summary? Are we voting for something that's this space summary plus you know, extra flexibility or extra potential large gym summary somehow? So maybe you're getting to that. I just wanted to make sure we don't just kind of vote on this one quickly without clarifying that. So sure. process wise, <clears throat> if I may Don, I would recommend yeah. summary as the basis of the middle school project and then requesting that the design team explores the an additional uh, full-size gym component during the concept review. So but, that will keep them moving forward in feasibility with the, the overall school space, if you will, the educational space with, a, with an option to at what a, you know, a larger gym and, would and do. Perfect. perfect. That's if I mean, Kristen, just to clarify, options to increase the gym size because we may not get to the full size. So I think they're, you know, to Chris's point earlier, the what are the incrementals that we can possibly achieve? Mm -hmm. uh, Lorraine, Lorraine and Kristen, that, uh, this is probably a good time for me to bring this up. I was going to bring it up maybe later, but I just want to make sure that our architectural team remains productive and remains productive toward a schedule. Um, and we're hearing that, well, we're going to most likely go ahead with uh, the, the design, um, but keep in mind this larger gym or explore opportunities for uh, community use. So um, I just want to make sure that Lorraine and Kristen are clear on exactly what's being asked of them, because I, I was picturing them going back excitedly and digging into this project. And now there's a little bit of a differential going on. And I, I just like to hear, I don't, don't want to put you on the spot, Lorraine and Kristen, but I just want to be, be clear of what exactly that main team is going to do and how they're going to stay focused on what they're doing with, with also looking at other options. I think what we would recommend is adding another MSBC meeting um, that, so, that wasn't planned. <laughs> Yes, and that's what I was alluding to, Heather. So we have a design subcommittee meeting on 316, I think, March 16th, um, not next week, but the following Tuesday, I believe. I'm going to look at court as a... I will confirm that. Uh, okay. And yes, uh, 730 Tuesday, the 16th, correct. Okay, so on um, the 16th... Are folks available to add in an additional, because there are agenda items that got bumped from last meeting to this meeting and will likely get bumped given that I think some people have a hard 9.30 stop, I know I do, um, to add in an additional meeting two weeks from now? Would that be, would folks be amenable to doing that? And what that will allow us to do is have our designers go back and um, start to, you know, sharpen pencils and start drawing again, look at options, but also look at what the ask on a larger gym would mean from a square footage standpoint, 
Um, I know Phil had pointed out that to get to what you wanted might be 13,000. Could you do it in smaller? I don't know. What does that mean? But then also allows us as a committee to do a little bit more homework and outreach and um, have a better understanding to kind of close that loop on the that discussion. Does that sound like? So <clears throat> the, the design team would bring uh, for a discussion uh, uh, the uh, alternates that uh, we've been discussing today on the 16th. And then two days later, we had a meeting for the full committee Thursday, the 18th. I'm gonna look at them to see if they're comfortable with that. I think that's a good, that's sort of the process we've been going through as far as a, a, a look from the design subcommittee and then a, a larger group discussion. <clears throat> yes, Kristen, I think I saw your head yeah. nodding. Yeah. Okay. So, just, Sean, if I might, just to be very clear, it, sure. would be, it would be very conceptual, and I know you know what this means, but very conceptual floor plan diagrams that accommodate the space summary you're voting on and what options there are for incrementally increasing a gym. We're not going back and looking at taking space away from the space summary you're about to vote to create more. So this is correct. Yes. Yeah, so. Uh, yeah, I would say, uh, to, if I could answer that, I'll give you my answer, Lorraine. We're not looking for it. But if you brought it to us, we'd listen. You know, if you've got some creative solution we haven't thought about for consolidation, but uh, what, what you're hearing today is the the sizing for student facing uh, instructional space is uh, sacrosanct, let's say no, that's that's not in play right now. Is that the consensus of the it is the consensus of the design subcommittee. I don't know if it's the consensus of the entire committee. Can, assuming that it is, um, Lorraine, would would we be able to hear um, any information about how much larger that makes the footprint of the building and the impact on the 15%? And would we be able to hear any kind of guesstimates on the cost of, of moving to a larger gym? Kristen, I'd, I'd need yes. to use of that yeah. in that time frame. Is that enough time for you? We, um, yes, we can in a conceptual level. Great, great. Okay, and then, and then just as we go forward, it doesn't have to be discussed now, we just wanna make sure that um, th th this effort, which is, which is great, um, we, we just have to look at the sch scheduling of it and you know, how SMMA fit, fits it into their schedule. If we're gonna keep where, where we are getting to uh, schematic, that's all. Okay, so where does that leave us? Are we ready to entertain motions on the two recommendations that have been put forward today? Uh, I, I would move that the uh, school building committee uh, accept the recommendations of the two subcommittees, design and sustainability as submitted to the meeting today. Thank you, Court. So moved. Any seconds? I'm going to shut off my video because I keep getting your internet. On, like, <laughs> people are breaking up, and I don't know if my connection's not good right now. So moved. <laughs> okay, so I think Court made the motion. Are you seconding, Frank? I was, yes. Okay, excellent. All right, so with that, I'm going to take a roll call uh, vote. And is everyone clear on the motion? Sorry, before I do that, any discussion? And is everyone clear? I just. Um... Don, I just yes, want to make sure, I, and I heard that 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 this is not a final endorsement of the space. That the we are going to continue to look at the gym, just as they said. And I don't know if we should qualify that as part of the motion, um, so that it, it's clear. Yeah, to, um, your, to, to your point, we're we're accepting, we're not approving. I, I know it's parsing here, but okay. Uh, and for what it's worth, that's normal in the process. Um, at least on an MSBA project, you you always have to resubmit your space template and assuming like there might be a 900 square foot space that gets a two 450s and or like because of inherent to where it is in the building, it has to be a little different size there. 
there are definitely that's part of the process. <laughs> so the this is not just a linear you we take it from what we're looking at today and it's finally designed. This will definitely be iterative. So um, I don't know if uh, it's up to you if you want to add language to your motion that says that. Um, but as a designer, it's inherent that so, that you know along the way things will be fluid, and if that means that a space is now shared or omitted in a way that it can be dual purpose, then that comes back to the greater group for discussion and and is brought up in the design. But I think what we're saying today is that the space template that the design subcommittee is suggesting approval for includes the spaces that we believe to date meet the educational plan and allow the educators to deliver education to the middle schoolers in Concord. And, and to Peter's point, uh, the, the records are going to note that we've also directed our design team back for more work. So that is, is a very clear declaration that uh, we're, we're not done. Would, would that be so? Yes. Uh, yeah, I'm comfortable with with where we are. So Dawn was coming in and out. I'm looking for her on the screen. Uh, if yeah, I'm gonna go upstairs, sorry, see if my internet's better. Um, but I think unless, if there's more discussion, um, feel free to uh, insert, otherwise I'll pop back on and I'm yeah. just gonna walk upstairs um, and hope that it's a better connection. With, with your approval, maybe Pat, if discussion's done, can do the roll call. Not bad. Discussion done. <laughs> do we have any more discussion? Anybody? All right. I just, I just want to. I just want to commend the design subcommittee for their work. I know we, you know, we thank the, we thank the sustainability subcommittee, but I also think the design subcommittee deserves a lot of recognition. They really spent an inordinate amount of time on it um, to get to get to a place where we're kind of sorta moving forward with their recommendations, um, and I don't want that. Um, to reflect on the um, detailed approach that they took. I think they did a really masterful job getting to this point. Yeah, I want to second that. And I, I sat in on those meetings and um, there was a lot of wrestling with a lot of detail and um, I really appreciate that. So mm -hmm. thank you, Design Subcommittee. Um, and thank you. I'm sorry, Pat. Um, I want to echo that as well, even though I'm a subcommittee member. I know how much work it took to get to where we are and all the, um, you know, all the hard work that the subcommittee members put into getting us to this place. If anyone goes back and watches the meetings and knows the amount of discussion we had, um, there was a lot of content and background and I'm appreciative of everyone's time and efforts. So Thank you for those who, Stephen and Pat, for saying that. And I echo that as a committee member that others have put a lot into this in court with chairing it. So thank you, everyone. It, it was our pleasure and thank you. <laughs> okay, I think, oh, go ahead. No, Did you no, have something, Stephen? No, I don't. Okay. <laughs> no more haircuts, Stephen. <laughs> no. I'm kidding, I love your analogies. All, All right, right, so with that, I'm gonna take a roll call. Uh, Pat Nelson. Yes. Uh, I don't think we ever saw Matt, did we? Court Booth. Yes. Heather Bout. Yes. Just, Justin Cameron. He had a crisis to step away from it. Oh, that's too bad. Okay. Um, Frank Cannon. Yes. Stephen Crane. Yes. Kate Hanley. Yes. John Harris. Yes. Russ Hughes. Yes. Lori Hunter. Yes. Charlie Parker. Yes. Chris Popoff. Yes. Matt Rue. I know Matt's on both subcommittees, so I, I'm sure he would have voted favorably, but we're going to have him abstain since he's not here now. And then Jared Stanton. Yes. And Peter Fischelis. I will get it. I had it in my head earlier. Yes. Peter. Yes. And Don Guarillo, I'm a yes as well. So. Great. I know this is a huge crossroads. We took a lot to get to where we are. So I'm excited to allow our design and OPM teams to move forward um, with these recommendations. So thank you everyone for all your hard work on that. 
Now with that, it's 921 and I know we still have more agenda items. I wanna give some time for community input if we have community members. Let me see what's left on the, we have schedule, cash flow schedule. We sort of touched on last time, but thought we'd get to it this time. And all the fruitful discussion has of course not allowed us to be able to spend the time required at that. I'm going to ask uh, Peter from Hill, Peter and Ian, is it okay to put this forward at the 318 meeting that we were proposing? Would that be okay? Or do you guys feel you need, I don't want to short change the schedule. It's super important, but. Um, um, it, it might be good to spend five minutes on it if, if we can today, just to throw out options and, and get it in people's minds so that we can come back and discuss it next time. Is that fair? Okay. Could you, um, did someone have something to say? No. Um, okay. Could you give us the 30,000 view and maybe then share the, what you're going to propose as a visual, like a, share the, I think everyone might've received this actually with the slides for today. If folks can take time between now and the 18th to kind of digest it and come up with questions, maybe that's the best way to do that, Ian. Yeah. Yeah. That's Great. fine. Thank you. Take it away. So, I'm sorry. Yeah. So uh, just real, real quickly here. So we put together two basic options. Um, there, there's many other options that we could have ran out here, but these are kind of the, the two main options uh, looking at um, no early release of some of the design phases and then, and then looking at option B, which is early release of schematic design and design development. So this kind of lays out the, the timelines here in those two scenarios. Um, so it takes you through um, feasibility and schematic design through this year um, in which uh, we're leading up to a special town meeting. Um, the placeholder that we have is December 10th and then um, allowing you know a, a pretty significant window of time between special town meeting and the special town election, um, a 90 day period uh, between those. Um, and that's kind of as, as, as far out as that could push um, between meeting and vote. Um, and then proceeding with design development and construction documents, bid award and, and construction and, and move in. So that, that uh, schedule ends in late March, 2025. Um, and I'd like to point out that uh, the, the escalation on that um, for bid time would be uh, quarter two in 2023. So there's a there's a 1% uptick there um, for escalation as uh, uh, related to what we're carrying now in the, the um, 555 per square foot assumptions and the overall project budget. Um, scenario B is an early release. So this is an effort to, to um, condense the schedule down a little bit and gain uh, some time on uh, move-in, uh, gets you back into quarter one of bidding in 2023. And so what this will do is, you know, same kind of time frame in, in 2021 here to go through feasibility and schematic design. Um, it would, it would uh, overlap the feasibility and schematic design a little bit. Um, in order to provide more of a cushion between the end of schematic design and the town meeting, um, uh, which would which would probably be a good thing there. Um, but, uh, you know, the first scenario also works as far as deliverables, uh, just provides a little more cushion. Um, if you were to release schematic design um, a little bit earlier in May instead of later in May um, and have some overlap there. And then... Uh, it also condenses the time frame between special town meeting and special town election. So, uh, you know, having a, a town election a week after the meeting or, you know, that's like the, the extreme version here, just, just to show the, the uh, difference. Um, but really, as soon as you can after the town meeting um, is what this is trying to communicate. And, and there, there's probably a sweet spot there between the December 17th and the March March 10th uh, dates. But 
this would allow you to start the design development construction document earlier. It moves up the bid to Q1 in 2023, which gets 8% escalation that we're carrying um, in the budget. And um, the construction schedule is the same. It's an 18 month duration, but it gets you into the school uh, kind of mid year of 2025, right after um, the uh, winter break there. So um, there is an al alternate um, option on this schedule B scenario where Hey, Ian, uh, I'm really yeah. sorry to do this to you. Sorry. <laughs> well, I really, everyone has a hard stop at 930 and it's 927, yep. about to be 928. Yep. And I do want to open it for, for feedback. So can everyone sure. please take time in the next two weeks to review this? If you have questions, um, come prepared at the meeting. I will let Ian have the floor <laughs> to get deep into what this means. But basically there's a scenario where we approve an early release of design development or don't and it affects everything. Like there's a sweet spot for all the town um, between the, the town meeting and the ballot and we need to be respectful of that. So I th I'm sorry to, to cut you short, Ian, but that's the, that's difference, right. the differences. Um, yeah, and I wanna open it up to, so sorry, Ian, I hate to. That's, that's <laughs> right. that's right. Let's that's open it up, Don. Right. Let's let those people okay. speak. <laughs> yes, please. So I'm gonna open it up to community um, uh, comment. If anyone um, could either show your hand in the participants or turn your camera on if you would like to, um, to speak, please. Anyone? We may have lost folks too, because I know that uh, We've gone long again, and I apologize for that, everyone. No one? No one. Ian, you want your two minutes back? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, how dare you? <laughs> no, I, would just like to I, would just like, I would just like to add quickly to, to Andy Ian's brief. It's a, it's a matter of, of risk proceeding uh, prior to votes and approvals, et cetera, and you are, you are risking design fee should you pr proceed so basically and we need the money to do it right, right? yep exactly so, so. That, that's really the, the the deal there are you willing to risk having you know getting the money and having the architect proceed with drawing um and you know <laughs> maybe going ahead so mm -hmm. the risk analysis great anything else now a motion to adjourn for real ah oh, thank you steven <laughs> thank you steven any any second, second? Almost. Excellent. All right. And with that, I'll just do a quick roll call. We have Pat. Yes. Pat yeah. uh, Cole Booth. Yes. Heather Bout. Yes. Justin Cameron. He's still oh, yeah. He had to leave. Sorry. Frank Cannon. Yes. Stephen Crane. Yes. Kate Hanley. Yes. John Harris. Yes. Russ Hughes. Yes. Lori Hunter. Yes. Charlie Parker. Yes. Chris Popoff. Yes. And Jared Stanton. Yes. And Peter Fischelis. Yes. Fischelis. And Dawn, I'm a yes. Okay. Sorry, everyone. We'll see you on the 18th. We'll um, get information ahead of time out on that. Thank you all for sticking through this. There was a lot of good discussion today. So thanks, everyone. Thanks, Kristen. Thanks, Lorraine. Right. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.